Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very challenging one on the Gospel in Galatians. This is lesson number 12 in that series, entitled Living by the Spirit. It's the lesson for September 16 of 2017. Hope you've enjoyed the lesson so far. Here's another challenging one, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, as we read these words and we try to comprehend what Paul was thinking and what he was saying and then to place ourselves on the side of the Galatians and realizing the challenges they were facing in their churches, we recognize that it was a serious time. People could be killed for just admitting that they were Christians. And at the same time, there were others who were trying to deceive them and lead them to change their ways, to go back to the old legalistic ways of doing things. We, we need to ask ourselves, are we in danger of either one of those threats in our day? Let's, let's think about Paul's words and try to follow his logic to this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're talking about a battleground, a battleground between God and Satan, a battleground which has come to be called the Great Controversy. Where does that battleground take place? In our minds. Between our ears. Are we going to live according to Christian love or satanic selfishness? Well, do you feel like you're a battleground, or do you feel like you're in a battleground sometimes? Spirit wars against the flesh. Mm -hmm. This is not a physical battle, although it has physical implications. It's a mental and a spiritual battle. And Paul, um, I'm not going to take time to read the passage, but if you know Romans 7, verses 14 to 24, he says, here I am, I'm struggling with this. He says, the things I want to do is not what I do, and the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. And you would think, boy, this guy's in real trouble, right? Yeah, that would be the natural response of just read through that passage. But then he comes to Romans 8, 1, and what did he say? Thanks be to God who has given us the victory. Wow. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death in our members. So how do we win by walking in the spirit? How does that work out in the 21st century? Well, every honest Christian will admit that there is a daily struggle between the fleshly desires, the natural human wishes and wants, and the promptings and pleadings of the Holy Spirit. How do we get from the works of the flesh to walking in the Spirit? Well, here's a, one description of that, some kind of a description by Ellen White. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. So a selfish life, who's, whose side are we on there? Satan. That's Satan's complete program, right? If you have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of his goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart. And by every means in your power, seek to save the lost. As you receive the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth, bring forth fruit. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. It's a, it's a practice. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, the work of a lifetime. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. Christ is waiting. And here's the, the real challenging words. Christ is waiting with longing desire. God is just longing for this, for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them. 
as his own. Wow. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.12, using the words from the margin that she used. For all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Christ Topic Lessons, pages 67, paragraph 3 up to 69, paragraph 2. Wow. So how do we do that? What, what kind of mechanism is being described there? Would he respond to the drawing of Christ as he's lifted up? And if we don't resist, we will be drawn and we will continue to we be, behold him, we become changed. By beholding, we become changed. If you like what you see, and you say, God, help me to become more like that. And we give him the time and the, we allow him the, F, the, the, the access to our, to our minds, it will happen. How do children learn to be like their parents? Watching. Well, how do they, how do they learn to speak the language? You know, think of all these things. I, I never forget uh, one of my professors in medicine who had a cancer in the upper part of his arm here, so he had, had to have his arm cut off at the shoulder. So he learned how to do all kinds of things with one hand. And so his children, who had two perfectly good hands, <laughs> learned to do things with one hand. Why? That's what they saw. That's what they observed, right? And, and you can think of lots of other examples of this. Uh, my grandchildren, their mother is a native French speaker. Their father is obviously an American. So he speaks English to them, and his, the mother speaks French to them. And so what do they do? They don't, they don't have any problem with that at all. They look at dad and they speak perfect English. They look at mom and they speak perfect French. How does that happen? By beholding, we become changed, right? There's some very interesting passages in the Bible that talk about how this works. One of the most interesting is found in Psalm 115. He starts out, To you alone, O God, to you alone and not to us must glory be given because of your constant love and faithfulness. And then he poses some questions. Why should the nations ask us? Think about what was going on around in the nations around David in those days. Why should the nations ask us, where, where was your God? Now, why would they ask that? Well, there's no idols. There's no whatever. Where is your God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wishes. Their gods are made of silver and gold, formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, and feet but cannot walk. They cannot make a sound. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. <laughs> think, of the, think of the implications of that. Well, the Assyrians in ancient times worshipped a god, their god, their chief god, they had more than one, but their chief god was a god of war. So what kind of people were they? Warlike people. So what modern day idols do peaceful people worship? Well, in the old days, the craftsman would meditate on a particular quality and he would fashion that idol and the disciples would come and meditate on that idol in order to absorb and become like <coughs> that particular quality, whatever it is. Today, we, more often, we have craftsmen who make stories and movies and moving images that reflect the qualities that they worship. Mm -hmm. And people come and sit and absorb that and become like that. You know, we've, we've talked about all kinds of examples mm -hmm. of things that we look at and we become like. And we talk about our parents, we talked about idols, we talked about other things. Now, when God's spirit, if he's spirit and we worship him in spirit, what are we looking at? 
Well, that was what, that's what David's enemies were, were asking. The you life know, of Jesus. We're looking at the life of Jesus. Well, I've never seen the life of Jesus. Well, it's, uh, it's, on, the, it. it's on the pages of a book. Do I, how do I know that I'm interpreting it right? Well, and, and the answer to that is you read all of it, and then you read all of it again, and then you read all of it again. And it's, it, there's enough different things that, that you begin to develop a, a whole picture of what's going on there. Um, and and there, there really isn't any other way. That's the only way you can do that. Um, but, yeah. And if, if you say that's not good enough, then you're accusing God of not giving us an adequate well, explanation. Well, we're worshiping God in spirit. Just how is that connection made? Is it just through, through words that we read? It's through, our it ner through it's through our nervous system. Yeah, it has yeah, to come into the word. Yeah. The spirit gives life to those words. The spirit gives you impressions and, and thoughts and, and For us. Uh, draws you to Christ through those. those. And it can be nature. It could be the yeah. word. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be th what somebody else is doing for you. Yeah. Uh, God's spirit working through them. L let's, let's be honest here. We believe as Christians and Advent Christians that we are facing the fairly imminent return of Jesus Christ. If, we pre if we're going to prepare a world for that event, we're trying to accomplish something that has never been done in the history of our world. We're, this is not talking about any ordinary sort of activity. This requires, this is going to require a real all-out unusual effort. You know what that is? Well, we're going to talk about that. Are we in the world but not of the world? That would be part of the question. That was Jesus' prayer. Mm -hmm. So why does God allow this battle to go on? Why, why doesn't he just sort of isolate Satan off over somewhere so he doesn't, doesn't keep it harassing us. Because we are free. Because we're free. Yeah. Every well, word I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life, which means that this, the word has mm -hmm. to come first before the spirit can take over. Right. Exactly. And, and the spirit comes through the words. Yeah. Right at the uh, beginning of the Bible, you got Genesis 1, or through Genesis uh, 1, chapter 3, and also you got Job 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. And also you got the whole book of Job is a bunch of lies. Mm -hmm. all, all of those guys, because you get to the last chapter and it says, wait, you guys haven't been telling the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, so God is so free, gives grants so much freedom to all of his intelligent creatures to tell all the lies they want to tell. Yeah, scary. And, and you got the biggest politician was, was Satan, Mm -hmm. And who is self-centered. Can you think of a politician that is not self-centered? Well, <clears throat> I've been watching someone on the, on the news recently. I mean, it's by definition, isn't it, almost? Yeah. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> what about the idea of once saved, always saved? Why, why doesn't God just do that? It would be so much easier. That's not how it works. That's not how it works? <laughs> no, why it's doesn't it work that way? There has to be growth. Mm -hmm. Like a tree that grows, a Christian life grows into ever greater love. It's almost that simple to put in words. How, how are we going to develop the skill to tell, to clearly, remember Jesus said, if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. We're going to have to be able to just distinguish between the slightest deviation from the truth. How, how, do, we, how do we develop that kind of a skill? You're, are you sure it's it's that kind of a precision, or is it just that? It is. No, it sounds to me like it says something's got to be there, or else the very elite, elite, the smartest people won't figure it out. Something has yeah. to be there, It'll not be necessarily that that you got to get this exactly right, or you're going to get zapped. You know. No. No. Oh. I think I think something has to be there. And if it's well, gone, yeah, no. but it doesn't matter how smart you are, mm -hmm. you're not going to make it. Well, yeah, and, and that, that's true. The thing that has to be there is a very clear understanding of the truth so that you can't be deceived. Yeah. 
Well, so the will has to be, yeah. we, we, we must be willing to do the will of God. Is it, always, is it always obvious, okay, this is the right and that's the wrong? No, because we're in a state of confusion. So we don't always understand the ramifications of everything that we have to think about. And if we can't figure it out intellectually, how can we do the right thing? That's why it's so important to study the words of Jesus, because they are spirit. They will form the way we think. They will affect the way we, we think. And it's the way we think. It's out of the abundance of the heart. I'm com coming back to the heart that the mouth speaketh, or that the body acteth. So the heart has to grow into ever greater love. In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Do not be fooled. Bad companions ruin good character. What does that imply? Because if we're companions with them, then we're beholding them. Yeah. Like Psalms 1, we stand in the stand in the ways you see blessed is the man who walketh not in the walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful so there's kind of this progression yeah. uh, away from god yeah it doesn't mean we should reject those people it just no. means we shouldn't go along with their way of thinking yeah so there's going to be two messiahs coming at the end of this earth's history. And there's probably going to be a whole lot. Well, in fact, we know there's going to be a lot. So it's not just, well, we reject the first one and, 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 and we accept the second one. Um, Jesus himself said there will be false Christs, false messiahs, false prophets, right? In Matthew, uh, in Matthew 24. So, but there will be two, and, and the one who will be the most deceptive of all is who? Satan himself coming and pretending to be Jesus. He will look like Jesus. He will sound like Jesus. How are we going to be able to know that this guy is not the true one? Now, I've heard all sorts of explanations. Well, you know, the real Jesus, when he comes, his feet won't touch the ground. Yes. You don't think Satan is so foolish that he's going to let us distinguish between the true, the truth, and the false with something simple like that. You know, he, he'll have a cloud over his feet so we can't see whether it's, it's whatever he, I don't know what he'll do, but he, there'll be ways. I mean, he who seeks to do the will of the Father will know. Some people say, well, he won't have the nail prints in his hands. Well, Satan may not, might not let us see his hands. We don't know. Um, and, or or, he, or could, he may have nail prints in his or hands. Or he may have nail prints in his hands just to make it look phony or make it look like it's real. I'm sorry. So, in the earliest Christian writings, the Christian's life was described as the way. Look, for example, John 14, 6. Jesus answered them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. And so, they took that verse and they said, are you in the way? Remember that uh, if you're walking along a, a road in ancient times, and you might be miles from nowhere almost, and you know, dusty paths and you're walking along, you came to somebody, you'd stop and say hi to them and talk a little bit. And they always carried sticks because there were animals out there that were, were, would love to take you down or eat you up or whatever. So all, virtually everybody carried a walking stick. And if you thought maybe there was a possibility that this person that you just run into, after you hear them talk a little bit, that maybe they were a Christian, you would sort of just casually draw a line like that in the, in the dust. And if that person was a Christian, they would know about the sign and they would draw the other half making a fish. And why did, fish, why did a fish become the symbol for Christianity? Because the name for fish in Greek is ichthus, and that's an acronym for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. So the fish, that's why you sometimes see fish on the back of people's cars. It's, that's, a, that's an acronym. Well, in the Old Testament, the life of the faithful Jew was described as halakha, or walking in the law. How is that different from the way it's talked about in the New Testament? Is it easy to walk in the way or is it hard? Jesus said his 
uh, yoke is easy and his burden is light, and he is the way. And he also said he would go through the narrow gate, didn't he? Not the broad gate. Easy to do our own will. Yeah. The Bible describes human beings as being born in, the si born in sin. How did we get that way? Well, uh, we could talk about original sin and all the implications of that. Yes? Well, I, Jesus said that the uh, angels of the little ones do continually behold the face of the Father. And I think that's the, the state of the unfallen. And when they turned and sinned, uh, the Holy Spirit was taken away from them. They could no longer behold God and live. And so they fell, and we, that's what we inherited. Uh, well, we're uh, dead in our trespasses. We're spiritually dead. You know, sometimes people say, well, they didn't really die for 900 years, but spiritually they died right there. I, I have um, sometimes tried to describe this problem in very concrete ways. Uh, are we born in sin? Yeah. None of us was ever inside the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve started there, they were fine, but when they sinned, they were cast out, and all the rest of us are born outside of that garden. We, we don't have the option of being born in the garden. So, well... <clears throat> in Jesus, we have a path back to God. And that's and we what we need to talk about. Again. What basic change is happened when Adam and Eve became the first human sinners? What, what, what kind of change took place? The self-centeredness mm -hmm. is what caused the first sin. So how does sin change us in 2017 and thereafter? Corrupts us further and further. Mm -hmm. Do our children obey us because they fear us or because they love us? Maybe they don't yeah. obey us. Maybe they don't, okay. Didn't Adam and Eve obey God voluntarily and freely before they sinned? For a time. Hmm? For a time. For a time, yeah. There's a Christian bumper sticker, you may have seen it, which says, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. What does that mean? If you're one's not going to heaven, the other one is. Okay. If you're born again, you have a chance of living eternally and not dying. Mm -hmm. Is this a math problem or something? It's a math problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, how does that relate to the daily walk of a Christian? And, and what, how is... How, is it, how are the lives affected of people who say, well, I, w I, w I, w I was saved once and now I don't need to worry about it anymore. How does that affect their daily walk? Paul said he died daily. So it's not just a one-time thing. It's, it's a relationship. And it can grow and flourish or it can wither and die depending on whether we continue to keep the Lord ever before us. We've talked about the teachings of Plato before, but let me just review them. Plato told his Greek students that human beings consist of a body, which is basically evil, and a soul, which is basically good. He taught that trapped inside that evil body is this good soul. This dualistic view of man was incorporated into certain Christian views in the early, in the early centuries. It was known as Gnosticism because the, the reason, the Greek word for knowing is gno. You don't say the G, just we say no. Uh, they had a G at the beginning of the word instead of a K. We put a K there. Um, so on one extreme, it led to the ascetic movement. The ascetics believed that every fleshly, pleasure-loving, pleasure even, uh, even eating food, which tastes good, was evil. This group did their best to separate themselves from any human pleasure. Now, I don't know if, if you have noticed this, but as you, as you go back further and further into history, and earlier and earlier into the history of the Christian churches, you look at images of Christ, and what did he look like? Almost like a skeleton. Why? Because obviously he denied all, himself of all the pleasures of evil, right? And he had nothing but the, the good. 
So if you look at those early, the further back you go, the, the skinnier and the more bony they were because they thought that that was good. Well, this, this type of thinking led to something we talked about last week, the story of St. Simeon Stylites. And if you get our handout, which is available on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. You'll see the, hand, you'll see the uh, link there that takes you to where it talks about St. Simeon Stylites. Well, he lived outside Aleppo, Syria. Simeon was so concerned about the sins in his life that he decided to build a tower 10 feet tall and live on top of that tower. He thought it would be much more difficult to sin living up in the air many feet above the ground. I wonder if he ever did any sleepwalking. <laughs> As time went by, he made the tower taller and taller until he was up to 50 feet in the air. Soon other Christian follow, Christians followed his example. So if this works, well, let's all do it, right? And they developed an order of Christianity called the Order of the Stylites because that's, that pole up there was called a stylus, the pole sitters. Ascetics believed that by putting the flesh to death, they were giving life to the soul. Is there anything wrong with that thinking? Not a very good life. Not a very good life. <laughs> we have to throw in little the pleasures of sin in order to make it a good life. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Jesus said that he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. He who seeks to lose his life for my sake shall s uh, save it. And the word for life that he uses is the same one as soul. Suke. Okay. Yeah. So. By contrast, there was another group, in contrast to the pole sitters, who also had a dualistic idea of him, about human beings, they concluded that since the body is hopelessly evil, it really didn't matter what they did with their bodies. They thought they were free to commit every kind of sin, more or less doing whatever they wanted. The Gospel of John was written at least partially to counter, to counter the Gnostic heresy. So I have this saint inside me, but my body is a real sinner. I mean, think about how crazy that is. But in both cases, they, neither of them were capable of, of really loving. Mm -hmm. uh, Simon had no relationships, really. Um, and these other people are abusing people. They're, they're doing evil things. They're not loving them. So that's all outside the kingdom of God. These so, are another example of the two ditches on mm -hmm. each side of the road. Either side of the road are just as bad. So which side of the great controversy are we on? When we choose. On a daily basis, do we sometimes do what the Spirit wants us to do and thus place ourselves on God's side? At times on a daily basis, do we also do what the flesh yearns to do and thus place ourselves on Satan's side? Do we jump back and forth in this war? Well, our, our situation... Ellen White says that it's not the occasional deed or misdeed, mm -hmm. it's the general trend of the life. So um, don't get stuck on the idea that, well, now I'm lost, now I'm saved, now, you know, that right. sort of thing. She, she, you know, if we're in Christ, we're a new creature, we, we may stumble, we may fall at times, but we have an advocate with the if Father. It, if through baptism we bury the old man of sin, and we have life to a new person living by the Spirit. We have to feed the new man and, and starve the old guy. That's what we've got to do. We gradually put to death the, 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 the... Paul calls it crucifying the flesh. That's a pretty stark kind of word, isn't it? Crucifying the flesh? But aren't there times when uh, we have choices between two bad things? And I think even Jesus found himself in that situation <coughs> when he was asked to pay a tribute or when he was asked <coughs> to pay a tax, a temple tax, that very place he had called or he was going to call again a den of thieves, pay taxes to that place that's yeah. just a den of thieves. Uh, he chose to do the least damaging between two actions here. And it's quite remarkable to look at Jesus that way. I once had a very bad experience 
that from the medical field, some of you know that there's a lot of ethical issues going on in the medical field. I was working in a hospital in Zambia, far away, and a lady came into the hospital, and she was, I don't remember exactly, three or four months pregnant. <coughs> but she had a severe heart condition. She was just barely making it. And we knew that if this pregnancy proceeded, she was going to die. So what do you do? Do you kill the baby to try to preserve mom, who already has three or four kids at home? Or do you let the both, you know, you try to, you try to let, keep them, well, I mean, well, I can tell you, she, she refused to even think about an abortion. She didn't understand all the implications. And she eventually died. Your body just couldn't deal with the stresses of that pregnancy. So, talking about choosing between two bads, that was, and we ended up choosing by, cho I mean, we actually ended up making the worst choice, really. But um, not because, I mean, that was her choice. Well, Paul, in a number of places in his writings, has long lists of sins. Romans 1 is a great example. <coughs> Ephesians 4, 1 and 17. Colossians 1, 10. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 is in our passage for this week. Which sins seem to get the most attention? By who? Well, by, <coughs> by Christians in general. What, what's the basic essence of sin? Isn't it selfishness? Selfishness. Yeah, selfishness. Uh, by contrast, let's just read once again that passage from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There's no law against such things as these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Wow. So some people have, have divided these, have, have tried to divide these traits up in various ways. Some people say, well, the real gift of the Spirit is love, and all the rest of those things happen as an outworking of love. Is that possible? What do you think? It's interesting, having read, if you read the verses just before that, where he talks about the list of sins, self demands we follow its inclinations. By contrast, the Spirit produces its virtues. Does God ever use force? Contrary to his nature. It's contrary. <clears throat> so when he knocked Paul down with a two by four, what's that? Using force? Just getting his attention. Just getting his attention. <laughs> what you mean by force, you know, yeah. if he's if he protects us from evil things, there could be Angels that s excel in strength may protect us, and you could say that's force, but he's not forcing us to make a choice there. He's protecting yeah. our yeah. ability to make a choice. We have to be careful not to have a literal reading of that text, because you can be knocked down emotionally without being knocked down uh, mm -hmm. physically, and certainly he was drawn to a way of thinking that was totally foreign to him mm -hmm. at that point in time. What a confrontation. Yeah. Well, the other interesting thing is that the sins that are described in Galatians 5 are many. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. Is, is there something important about that difference? Sure. What would be the important difference? There is only one fruit of the Spirit. It's love. Mm -hmm. All the rest are the expressions of that love. So if we talk about joy, it's the exaltation of love. If we talk about patience, we understand that that's also for loving reasons that we yeah. we are that way. So there are manifestations of love. Well, Peter has his ladder, and love is at the end of his ladder, and that's in Second Peter chapter one, verses five to seven. 
Do you think love should be at the beginning of the, the story or at the end of the story? Well, it, it doesn't really matter, does it? I, actually, it does, because I think that uh, we can become more loving by be being patient, by learning to be patient, by learning to be joyful, even though it's not our nature, mm -hmm. and that will lead us to love. But ultimately, it is love that takes on the driving force of the human heart and makes it possible for us to enjoy all of those other things. Mm -hmm. So you would say maybe that love is the fruit, but it has many seeds? It has many slices. Yeah, okay. <laughs> There, there are lots of things to think about in these lists. Is God trying to make things difficult? Does it really matter what we believe? Well, here's a very startling and, and, and stark comment from Ellen White found in the book Prophets and Kings. The present age is one of idolatry. Now, if I mention idols, where does your mind go, first of all? Idols. Like someone's worshiping an idol, and you think of what do you think of? Graven image. A graven image, but in time periods. I'm talking about time periods. Idols, Egypt. All those different gods. Yeah, we, think, we usually think of Old Testament, at least, don't we? Yes. Yeah. There are all those idols in the Old Testament. So, but she says, the present age is one of idolatry, as verily as was that in which Elijah lived. So this is told in the context of the story of Elijah. No outward shrine may be visible, there may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet thousands are following after the gods of this world, after riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit man to follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Whoa. Maybe we better read that again. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God. Now, how could they get a wrong conception of God? They project their own selves, their own desires onto God and say, this is well, what he's who's, like. Who's, who's been doing that for thousands and thousands of years? Satan. That is Satan's number one goal, is to misrepresent God, right? And he would like to, print, he would like to stamp that on every one of us. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Prophets and Kings, Ellen White, page 177, paragraph 1. Go back and read that a few times. Think about it. So where did erroneous views about God first come from? Satan. He had, believe it or not, he had those beginnings, at least, of those false ideas about God right in heaven, standing next to the throne of God. And he managed to convince, Revelation suggests, a third of the angels that he was right as opposed to God. I mean, just, you know, I, I, I can't wrap my mind around it that someone living in the presence of God could be so confused. You aren't suggesting that a church pastor could be wrong? <laughs> hmm. Theologians? Politicians? Now, politicians we know can be, but mm. not theologians? Of course, we're all, we're all right. And here around yeah. the table, we know exactly what God is. And, yeah. And <laughs> oh, God. I run. I yeah. mean, we're learning, yeah. but um, what about the part we don't know yet? Yeah. Is that, is that something we've got wrong? Well, we can trust uh, him with it. See, I think we have to be careful to consider this private interpretation of Scripture as not being just that of a certain person, but it can be that of a whole church. Mm -hmm. And the whole church should, co should constantly search its own heart, if I could speak that way. And is there anything in our belief system that doesn't really hold water? Mm -hmm. Are the We're vases. searching for that, though. Don't you think maybe the whole universe is searching that too? Well, erroneous views about God well, and about lies about him—that's yeah. something else. But well, that's it. not quite getting it right 
because we haven't had enough time with yeah. God is something we're, else. We're, we're going to be learning about God for eternity. Yeah. We can't begin to think we're going to, we're going to comprehend everything there is to know about God in one lifetime. So we're talking about lies. Upwards is a, a level of deception where you mix some truth with error, mm -hmm. uh, rather than just bald-faced lies. It's uh, it's, it's deceptive. It's a plan thing. It's oh, not for sure. You don't. It's not because you just don't have it right yet. Mm. It's that you know better and you you try to talk somebody into something that you know is false. Romans two fourteen and fifteen, and those who do not have the law do what the law requires, so that the law is written on their hearts. And what is the fulfilling of the law is to love. You go to Jeremiah 31. I'll wreck my law on your heart. Mm -hmm. Well, how does he do that? Not one by word. force. One he educates word. us. It's just love. one word. He, he, all he has to do is write love on our heart. and We've got all ten commandments mm -hmm. automatically there. I think he uses a ballpoint pen. <laughs> <laughs> so how do the ten commandments relate to Paul's list of sins and virtues? Of disappearing ink. <laughs> yeah. Would it be correct to say that obedience to the Ten Commandments will produce the fruit of the Spirit? Mm, I'd can. rather see it the other yeah, way around. I can. <laughs> well, Jesus said the whole law is Someday. to love God and to love your fellow man. And we say that is a reflection of the Ten Commandments. Sure. The first section is love for God. The second section is love for our fellow man. If okay. obedience it, it comes through a willingness to listen, mm -hmm. take instruction, and the ten, what we call the Ten Commandments are really a prescription, which is ultimately a description of the way all intelligent creatures will conduct themselves for eternity. Well, th there's a problem with the way <coughs> the word obedience keeps coming back in our Bibles, because oftentimes it should really say listening to God instead of obeying. One implies that you look at the law and you do what the law tells you. The other one, you're listening to him to find out how you should think that you might do what the law tells you to do. Yeah. To well, see if you can learn something. God's <laughs> saying to them, you guys don't listen. You don't yeah. take instruction. It's, it's that it. simple. Yeah. But here we put this word obedience to obey. and. Uh, well, and, and, and it's, we well the Greek word just means a humble willingness to listen. Exactly. And so, you need to be careful as to who you're going to do the listening to. Yeah, you sure. want to be sure that that, that that you're getting good message from the. Yeah. Well, we can't avoid getting a certain amount of wrong messages. We just need to distinguish. Discernment. Um, some have suggested. What do you think of this? That there are three groups of three in this uh, in Galatians five, twenty two and twenty three. Um, look at them just really quick, like here again. They would say that. Love, joy, and peace go together. Patience, kindness, and goodness go together. And then faithfulness, humility, and self-control go together. Three groups of three. Well, uh, what does that mean? Well, some have suggested these groups of three suggest the preeminence of the Trinity. I think that's really a stretch. <laughs> Others say they reflect how we should relate to God, the first three, to our neighbors, the second three, and to ourselves, the third three. Maybe so. Others see this, this simply as a description of the life of Jesus Christ, which we are to follow. Does this list divide itself naturally into groups of three? Uh, no. I don't, I, I, I have a little question about that. <clears throat> well, Paul emphasizes the role of love very clearly in his writings, as you all know, especially Galatians 5, 6, and 13, which were coming, coming up. He included love in almost every list of virtues, and there's many of those. Second Corinthians six six, First Timothy four twelve, and six eleven, and Second Timothy two two. Love is also the preeminent fruit of the spirit. First Corinthians thirteen, and and think about First Corinthians thirteen and Romans five five for them. I just look at that. This hope does not disappoint us, for God has poured out His love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. What did Jesus himself say about the role of love in the lives of Christians? And these verses always, I, I love to read these verses because they, they sort of shock me every time I read them. Look at this, John 13, 34 and 35. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. Well, that's not new. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that is new. But then he goes on, if you have love for one another, 
then everyone will know that you are my disciples. Is it really true that a truly loving Christian sticks out like a sore thumb so everyone knows? Maybe I shouldn't call it a sore thumb. He sticks out like a light. That's what Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, wasn't it? We're supposed to be lights. We're not supposed to hide them, hide them under bushels. Um, well, almost everybody recognizes that the preeminent characteristic of Christianity is love. And that's agape love. Love that operates from a principle. But it's, a, it's, it's something that uh, we can, as we suggested last week from, from Desire of Ages, page 668, it, we can actually get to the place where that becomes natural for us. Um, do you know people who are just naturally loving? How many like, do you, like that do you know? Well, they become that way more than they are that way. Yeah. While we do not want to oversimplify the truth, it is fairly clear that both non-Christian religions focus on rules and the retributive results if one does not follow them. And they're pretty serious. Many legalistic Christians take the same approach to God. How can we make sure that we are not doing the same? How can we gradually transform our lives from being self-centered to being God-centered? How can the Holy Spirit help us to accomplish this? Well, uh, in Ministry of Healing 5, 10, and 11, she, I've read this before, but you have a lot of That's to fine. share over. Yeah. <laughs> for two. The reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is they do not set the Lord always before them, mm -hmm. beholding again. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. And you must be men and women of prayer. Your petitions must be, not be faint, occasional, and fitful, but earnest, persevering, and constant. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking with the Savior when you are alone, when you are walking, and when you are busy with your daily labor. Let the heart be continually uplifted in silent petition for help, for light, for strength, for knowledge. Let every breath be a prayer. Amen. Very good. Well, our Bible study guide suggests that there's maybe five different steps or, or processes, something like that, which we need to go through. One, we need to walk by the Spirit or let the Spirit direct our lives. So we need to recognize that that's, that should be the, the guiding light. Two, let the Spirit lead us, following the example of Jesus. And so the way the Spirit leads is by pointing us to Jesus and no longer focus on our own behavior. What do we mean when we say no longer focus on our own behavior? Martin Luther was just absolutely compelled by his, what he thought of as his evil past and how he could, how he could somehow erase the, those evil records of his past. That's one of the ways. I mean, that was a good attempt on his part, and he was a wonderful Christian, but if we allow our past, even our personal past sins to consume us, they will do that. They will consume us. So three, then we will live by the Spirit who gives us life and controls our lives through His guidance. Four, then we can keep in step with the Spirit. And five, but, in this, but this is only possible by crucifying self. And that's not, I mean, obviously we're not out there building wooden crosses and somehow nailing ourselves to the wooden crosses. No, obviously, these are metaphors that talk about people who say, I want to be more and more like Jesus. I'm going to leave my past behind, and I'm going to keep progressing in that uh, right direction. We reckon ourselves as dead mm -hmm. in, in Christ Jesus, and then participate. If we participate in his death, we participate in his life as he rose. Jesus talked a little bit about that. It says, if your hand leads you into sin, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. If your eye leads you into sin, pluck it out. Uh, do you know any Christians with their, their missing hands and eyes? Not for that reason. Not for that reason, huh? I've heard of people who, who went to that extreme, but uh, 
but um, I, I, there's a sense in which that's physically true, uh, you know, if, if, if it, but he's really talking about the things that, that produce the behavior in the first place. Uh, well, he's just saying that th this is serious. Mm -hmm. This is serious stuff. That's what he's, he's trying to get across. It's, and he's also trying to say it's hard to deny the desires of the flesh. I mean, those, those inherent characteristics that we're born with, they're there. And it doesn't, doesn't come easy to get rid of them. They always seem to come back. So Paul said they must be crucified. What changes do we need to make in our lives to accomplish that step? Is it possible to identify these spiritual truths in the lives of others? Should people be able to tell that we are two Christians? Well, we just read the passage from John, 7, John 15, didn't we? John 13, it should be, actually. Matthew 5, 16, also, we should let our light so shine. We need to help each other with these challenges. We need to encourage each other. And as far as possible, we need to demonstrate the Christian virtues in our lives so others can see what it means to be a Christian. Do you remember what Paul said about that? 1 Corinthians 11, 1, what does it say? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Hmm. Wow. So we sometimes talk about the legal aspects or the forensic aspects of Christianity. How is that related to what we've been talking about? If our salvation rests exclusively on what Jesus has done for us, then why are we being asked to do all of this now? Is it clear how all of this is supposed to fit together? Well, <clears throat> here's a quotation from Ellen White once again. The life of the Christian is not all smooth. He has stern conflicts to meet. Severe temptations assail him. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, Galatians 5.17. The nearer we come to the close of this earth's history, the more delusive and ensnaring will be the attacks of the enemy. His attacks will grow fiercer and more frequent. Those who resist light and truth will become more hardened and unimpressible and more bitter against those who love God and keep His commandments. The easiest way to play, place to find that is volume 6 of the SDA Bible Commentary on Galatians 5, uh, page 111. I'm sorry, 1111, paragraph 7. And out, just a little bit later down that same page, actually the top of the next page, the influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. We do not see Christ and speak to Him, but His Holy Spirit is just as near us in one place as in another. It works in and through everyone who receives Christ. Those who know the indwelling of the Spirit reveal the fruits of the Spirit, spirit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. The Spirit of God keeps evil under the control of conscience. When man, exalt, when man exalts himself above the influence of the Spirit, he reaps a harvest of iniquity. Over such a man, the Spirit has less and less influence to restrain him from sowing seeds of disobedience. Now, we've talked about how by beholding, we can become more like Jesus. If we behold, if we spend our time beholding things on this earth, what happens? We become like that. We become like that. And that's... It is a law of the mind that by beholding we become changed. So if our, if our lives, our activities, our thoughts are full of movies and uh, stuff we read on the internet and the evils going on in the world and how we can uh, beat out our neighbors and uh, you know, trample them down while we earn more money maybe or whatever it is, we are following in the footsteps of Satan. Well. Over such a man, the Spirit has less and less influence to restrain him from sowing seeds of disobedience, warnings of less and less power over him. He gradually loses his fear of God. He sows to the flesh, he will reap corruption. The harvest of the seed that he himself has sown is ripening. And we're coming up, we're almost to Galatians 6. What does it say in Galatians 6, verse 7? Do you remember? 
Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. You will reap exactly what you plant. Mm -hmm. You will reap exactly what you plant. The harvest of the seed that he himself has sown is ripening. He has a contempt for God's holy commandments. His heart of flesh becomes a heart of stone. Resistance to the truth confirms him in iniquity. It is because men sowed seeds of evil that lawlessness, crime, and violence prevailed in the antediluvian world. All should be intelligent regard to the agency by which the soul is destroyed. And what's that agency? It's the same process. It's the human brain. But if our thoughts are following Satan's devices, his things that for us to his things that are attractive to our vision, the things that, that make us want to follow him, then which direction are we headed? Down, right? It's not because of any decree that God has sent out against man. He does not make man spiritually blind. God gives sufficient light and evidence to enable man to distinguish truth from error. But he does not force man to receive truth. He leaves him free to choose the good or to choose the evil. If man resists e uh, evidence that is sufficient to guide his judgment in the right direction and chooses evil once, he will do this more readily the second time. The third time he will still more eagerly withdraw himself from God and choose to stand on the side of Satan. And in this course he will continue until he is confirmed in evil and believes the lie he has cherished as truth. How do we how do we learn to how do we get to believe a lie? One step at a time. One step at a time. His resistance has produced its harvest. Again, SDA Bible Commentary, page one thousand one hundred and twelve, uh, paragraphs four and five. Well, assuming we are following the way of Christ as we grow to become more and more like Him, do we say do we think Satan will become more fierce in his temptations? Is he going to be happy if he sees us leaving his side? If we as end time remnant of Seventh-day Adventists are living in the last days, then we, will be, we should be prepared for the time when we will have to face the devil directly. We should be prepared to stand up for what we believe and we should demonstrate in our own lives the truths that Paul was talking about in the passage for this week. I hope what we have said will be of use to you as it has been to us. Our kind and wonderful Father, it is a privilege to serve you, and we, we acknowledge that. We recognize that there are two paths in our world, two sides, and we need to make our choices in favor of your side and not in favor of Satan's side. May that be, experience, be our experience and the experience of everyone who listens to us this week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>